Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And tonight we have Ellen Crosby, and here's a copy of her brand new book, The French Paradox. And we still have a number of signed copies. You can see that. Um, and Barbara is joining from her home. Looks like your library, or is that your office? That's your office tonight. Back in my office. The library is too risky because the dog wanders through. <laughs> Uh, for all of you watching on Facebook, um, I will be monitoring the comments field. So if you have uh, comments for Ellen, Ellen or Barbara, just go ahead and type those in there and I will emerge um, partway through the program to ask some of your questions. So in the meantime, I'll turn it over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Patrick. Welcome. Welcome, Ellen. It's so good to see you. So, Sadhu, what is it you're drinking? Yours is a real wine beverage. I can tell from the color. So I wouldn't forget. It's um, we drink since Andre's French. We drink French wine, and it's called Robin de Chateau de Robin de Moine, and it's from Saint Emilion. So, cheers. I have been to Saint Emilion, and the only reason that my glass is colored white is because I'm unfortunately taking antibiotics. So, wine is not. Not an option, which is really too bad because we're here to talk about another of Ellen's absolutely wonderful wine country mysteries. And the wine country that she writes about is in Virginia, which I find sort of mildly hilarious in the sense that and I, I say that because as a real student of history, I've spent time at Monticello. I have read about Thomas Jefferson's serious attempts to establish wine country in Virginia, right, right, right. Which, which were not successful. He didn't brought have a wine. A single bottle of wine from anything. No. He had 28 kinds of grapes. Never, never had a bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, it, it's really sad. If you go to Monticello, you discover that. Um, and yeah. you know, it makes you makes you wonder what different factors have have contributed to Virginia actually becoming a serious wine country. Part of it must be climate change. Part of um, it must be just soil science. I think well, part it, it all it went all the way back to Jamestown because when they when we when um, when the first settlers came over, they they real the British really wanted to have you know they found grapes growing in Virginia, so they sent French grapes over and they told all the colonists that they had to actually grow ten grapevines and, and do something productive with them, which didn't work. So Virginia kept trying, and Jefferson was really an instigator behind it, and George Washington, and you know it just went nowhere. And by the time the Civil War came around. Um, all the fields were trampled and everything was a ruin and then we had prohibition. So it didn't really come into its own until the 1980s when it, there was sort of this resurgence. And by then they, they were a little smarter about what kind of grapes were going to grow in Virginia. They were, you know, they were the hybrids um, and, and, you know, sort of American rootstock with, with, the, with the European grapes that they could finally grow. But it was, it was, it was a really big Deal. I mean, they called Thomas Jefferson the first wine geek because it meant so much to him for his country to have um, to have a wine industry. And don't forget, when he went to France as the ambassador, he spent a lot of time traveling all through the French vineyards. He really yeah. wanted America to have a wine industry. So it's been for Virginia, it's 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 personal. You know, I mean, the California blue past us, of course, but for Virginia, it's personal. It goes back to Jamestown. That is so interesting. I I you know I hadn't thought about American grapes, but of course. They weren't French and therefore might not have right. made decent wine, even if they could have figured out the whole system. Right. But have you know, I wasn't kidding about climate change, Ellen, because you do write in, in the books, because we're now, which book is this? It's like 12 or 15 11. in? 11. 11. Okay. Yeah. I knew it was quite a lot. Yeah. Um, that, you know, there's there's been replanting. I mean, you know, it's not always the same grapes. Things keep evolving. Certainly, if you travel in France and French vineyards, you can see that there has necessarily been um, replantings because some some kinds of species, some some species are not flourishing under today's climatic conditions. And I have read that Iceland may have a burgeoning wine industry coming. And so does England, apparently. Well, um, Scotland, I was going to say, you know, Scotland forever has been the whiskey trail and so forth. But now there's actually apparently a sort of nascent wine industry in Scotland. Um, you know, Upper New York has been uh, a, a place also where where you never would have thought about growing wine. But, but well, you know, grapes for wine. With um, the, this woman who's my, my advisor, or one of my advisors, she's probably the top wine consultant in the country. She she goes to France all the time, too. Her name's Lucy Morton, and she's always told me that she thinks I named Lucy Montgomery after her, because she had written a book about wine growing in the eastern United States that I'd read, and I thought, 
maybe I did, but so now she's my advisor. But what she's, we were talking about this um, last year when I was writing, when I was finishing The French Paradox, and she said, it's, yes, there's climate change, but she, she said, the other thing you need to remember is there's extreme climate. And especially in Virginia, we have, you know, we'll have like a fall that's nothing but like all rain. And then there was one year, two years ago, and I was doing an event with a, a Virginia bookstore and a couple of Virginia winemakers were on, where there was so much rain, nobody harvested any grapes. And so you're gonna get through the winter, but when you get to the next fall, there's no wine. So the big question in Virginia is, well, okay, if we don't have any grapes here, um, you know this whole story, I suppose, that if, if you get grapes from a vineyard, they are from the vineyard. If you get grapes from another vineyard in Virginia, you've made Virginia wine. If you end up, if in, you know, these little vineyards there, they're mom and pop places, they sort of live and die by who comes to their tasting room but they need grapes, so they'll get them from California or they'll get them from Oregon. And so then they're making American wine. And this gets into the whole issue of, do you care if the wine you're drinking is from the vineyard? You know, do you care where the wine comes from? But the extreme climate is changing all of that. And you just never, and what Lucy had said to me was, you never know when it's gonna come. So you sort of need to be prepared for, you know, for these changes. And one of the things she said is the new normal is there's new, no new normal. And it's it's really tough. So it's it's a well, yeah, there is no new normal. That's very, very true. And things like, you know, the German ice wines and so forth may, you know, may be a thing of the past if 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 it's not cold enough. But I mean, the wine industry is very strictly controlled in terms of what you can call things, how things are made, right. Um, right. and you know, percentages of alcohol. I mean, there's just yeah. so much involved in it. And yeah. you're right. I mean, you know, something generic and like American as opposed to a state bottled where it has to be, you know, much more specific. Um, I've traveled a lot in New Zealand, which I think is a wonderful wine country. And in yeah. fact, the first time we were there, I loved it because here in Scottsdale, there's subdivisions will spring up where somebody buys an old horse ranch and then, um, they'll stake out property that you can buy, you know, for houses. So you'll see like 16 lots for sale for individual or developer purchase or something on the former Arabian thoroughbred ranch. In wow. New Zealand, it was never for houses. You would go by and there would be, uh, it was all for wine. That's so you, know, you could buy like um, how many hectares for, you know, for yeah. wine. And yeah. I, I'm not even sure that in some cases it wasn't, it wasn't quite strict about if you bought it, what you could grow. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to, you know, you couldn't That's just true. buy X amount of it and then, and then put in whatever you felt like. So the wine know. industry is, is quite, quite controlled. And that's been part of the mysteries. But in this book, The French Paradox, let's get to that. Why not? That's why we... Okay, let's talk about it. But, yeah. um, in point of fact, the wine is not the critical plot element. It is, believe it or not, Jackie Kennedy, right. who really is the focus of this book. And not just Jackie Kennedy, but one of my favorite painters ever, Madame Vigée Lebrun, who yes. was a painter in Versailles at the courts of the Louis and, um, and Marie Antoinette. So I, I find this book really interesting because um, you managed to tie Marie Antoinette and Jackie Kennedy to a winery in Virginia. Well that, done. That was hard. I have to tell you. I, well, first of all, Jackie used to come to Middleburg. So that was um, that was sort of easy. I always knew I was going to write about her. She used to go there to ride and hunt as far back as the days when, you know, when her husband, when JFK was president. But I didn't know how I was going to tie them together. And I, have you read a book called The Lost Vintage by Anne Ma? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so she's a friend of mine. And I didn't know how I was going to tie. I have a friend who was on the board of the National Museum of Women and the Arts, and and she had said to me, you know, have you ever thought about writing about the lost mistresses, these women who were the as famous as the or the old masters, sorry, not the, the old ma the old mistresses, and and it was intriguing. And I knew I wanted to write about Jackie. And I thought, well, how could I combine them? And then Anne wrote this article for the New York Times Travel section, just as I was kind of trying to figure out how I was going to make my connection on Jackie Kennedy's junior year abroad in Paris in 1949, right after the war. And Jackie went over to study art history. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And so 
you know, in, in those days, the old mistresses weren't famous. They weren't well-known. You could pick up their paintings anywhere for like, as the French say, trois fois rien, you know, three times nothing. And so I thought, well, what if, you know, Jackie, who had this very discerning eye and was so, you know, um, becoming such a Francophile, um, what if she found some of these paintings in one of the bikinis along the Seine and, and bought them and um, then they became famous and then they're going to be donated to the National Museum of Contemporary Arts. So I got, that's how I got to tie them together. And it, it just, but it, it, there's always the thing that I have to find that ties them together. And Anne's article was the thing. So that was how I did it. Wow. Well, it was very well done. But in order to make all this work, you also had to give Jackie Kennedy a romance, or at least okay. at least a deep friendship, let's say, which naturally ties into Lucy Montgomery's family, in fact, her grandfather. Right. So I thought I thought that was, I mean, nobody can disprove it. Even if there's no concrete evidence, it does exist. Right? I had to age her grandfather. Her grandfather is actually based on my husband's uncle, who was all these people. He was in the French resistance, the resistance. Um, I aged him a little bit, but he was in the French diplomatic corps. Um, he was quite a, you know, a, 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 I mean, a Renaissance man, and he was really fascinating. So her grandfather was always based on, on my husband's uncle. And um, it just wasn't a stretch to imagine that he would have met Jackie. My mother-in-law knew Jackie. Um, his sister, my um, new Jackie, uh, when she when she used to come to New York to to um, see all the French couturier, all the designers who had brought their collections over. My mother in law worked at the French Commercial Counselor's Office in New York, and um, she accompanied. I mean, Jackie's French was very very good, but my mother in law went with her and, and helped her um, as her translator. So so uh -huh. she, yep. So that, we have Jackie in Paris, and um, obviously away from home and feeling her. Oh, oh, so to speak, yeah. which is not a bad phrase for Jackie, the horse lover. I mean, right, right. you know, um, and in forming a friendship with Lucy's grandfather and possibly picking up, well, definitely picking up paintings, mm -hmm. which she then brings back to America. Right. Right. And she there's actually a book that I managed to track down that I, I when I was doing my research that she she and her and Lee went to went to Paris it was in 51, so it was like two years later, their parents sent them and they kept a diary for their mother. And um, and it's full, it's it's all handwritten. And then Jackie did the most wonderful illustrations. And it was, you can imagine it was sanitized because it's going home to mom and everything. So they didn't say everything they got up to, but it's been published and it's called One Special Summer. And it's this charming book with Jackie's illustrations in it. It's really lovely. Um, but, but as I was going forward, I thought, well, how am I gonna tie all of this together? And I've always been really interested in her years as a book editor. And that was one of the things she was really, where I think she found the most fulfillment in her career. And she was 20 some years as a book editor at Viking and Doubleday. And she in fact edited a book of letters between Marie Antoinette and her mother, Maria Therese of Austria. Um, and her, she had such a love of France. She, she edited, a, uh, she was the editor of a book of um, Paris at the end of World War II. And so there was just all, it was just really kind of easy again to sort of bring her love of all things French. And she brought the Mona Lisa to America, as you, as you know. Um, so it was very easy to tie the art together and Jackie and my plot. So I, I, and I, I love doing that. I didn't realize, well, I mean, I kind of knew it, but I hadn't really focused on it, how much time Jackie spent in Virginia, in she Virginia did. horse country. Oh, and, she did. yeah. Yeah, but so that's she, another, another key part of your book is, you know, why would, why would all this, be in Virginia? And the answer was that Jackie spent so much time. Did she have an actual estate there or was she a guest? Yes and no. So they, they first came over and the story is that there was no Catholic church in Middleburg in those days. So they built one for Kennedy's. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And so they, I think they rented a home, uh, Wexford it was called. And then Jackie built a place and it was finished right before he was assassinated and she sold it. And then she ended up coming back later and she stayed, she rented a place or something like that. But she loved Middleburg because um, it was, it's wealthy, it's a horsey place, it's, you know, it's, it's all that. Um, and, but they gave her her privacy and nobody fussed or, you know, I mean, nobody made a big deal over her and she got all the privacy that she wanted. Um, and so it actually was in Middleburg, she was, she was fox hunting, she was out, it was November of 93 and her horse threw her and she fell and they took her. And there are people in Middleburg who still remember this story that who, because it's, it would have been, yeah, in the nineties. Um, and, and they took her to a clinic and that's when they discovered the lymphoma. 
So um, she went back to New York and six months later she died. And the interesting thing about that was that my mother-in-law had kept in touch with her all these years. And by then uh, my family had moved to London. So we, we were in London and we were waiting for our furniture to come. And my mother-in-law had written, me a, written us a letter and it came and she said, you know, I'm so worried about Jackie. She's been really sick. And I, I kind of lost track of that while we moved to London. Um, and she said, and my, my mother-in-law, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to John John. She still called him John John. She said, I'm going to find out from John John how Jackie is. And I thought, wow, she must be really, you know, doing poorly. And that day, our furniture came and the movers brought it. And there are these big burly, you know, blokes, these British guys bringing all the furniture in. And it made the BBC news that she had died. And I will never forget all of the movers crowding around the radio and the, of the cab of the truck sobbing. They were so upset. And I had no idea what an impact Jackie had. I mean, she was just, you know, she was as, as big a sort of star, I guess, or royalty in England as she was here. And I just never forgot the sight of these men, just devastated that she had passed away. So Middleburg loved her. And there is to this day, there's a wonderful little pavilion in the center of town. Middleburg's very tiny, but um, it's near the guest house or the, sorry, the, the visitor center called the Pink Box. And it's just a little pavilion with a little garden. And it's a place that you would have imagined she would have liked to have gone and, you know, and um, just sat and, you know, read or, or just enjoyed being in the garden. So Middleburg's very, I mean, it was her place. She loved it. Well, okay. So you've managed to tie so many things back to Virginia. Where, where is Lucy? Where's the Montgomery estate in relation to Middleburg? Um, it's, it's, you could pretty much, you know, throw a stone and hit Middleburg. I'm the, 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 the place that I, where it started out to be was just literally on the outskirts of Middleburg. Middleburg is one road. It's called, it's Route 50, which as it goes through Middleburg is called Washington Street for George Washington. And on the outside, it's called Mosby's Highway for a Civil War general who was known as the Grey Ghost. But, um, Route 50 starts in Ocean City, Maryland. It ends in I want to say San Diego. I mean, it just goes right across the country. It's like small, it goes through every small town in America. Um, and it's just a sweet little town with a traffic light and a main street and, you know, streets that are named for the signers of the Declaration of Independence because they were friends of the man who founded the town. It's, it's a charming little town. Very, very sweet and pretty, very horsey and tweedy. Um, a lot of Revolutionary War history and a lot of um, Civil War history too. So what happens? We start out and there, uh, Lucy is finally going to marry. Um, yeah, it took six books, right? Or five books, yeah. It did, right, yeah. yeah. You know, it was never a sure thing. But anyway, right. we know she's about to get married to, in fact, her winemaker. Right. Um, her brother, who has been something of a challenge, seems to be settled down. Um, right. And that's good because, you know, wasn't clear how that was gonna go for a while. These are spoilers, but you know, this is what we live, so we're stuck there. In any case, um, there's a, a famous um, landscape gardener that Lucy um, wants to plan the garden so it will look beautiful for her wedding. And we're in March, I think, right? And the wedding is May. So there's, we have a growing, we have time for the garden to grow. And for all of those, all of you who are, riveted to the gardener's world on Fridays in the UK, or, you know, suddenly discovered you have an affinity for gardening, you will like this book because um, the gardening part of it's wonderful. Anyhow, um, his name is Parker. So is he somebody that you based on a real person or you just made him up or what? I made him up, but, but Virginia has, um, we have what we call Historic Garden Week in Virginia, and it is, they call it America's Biggest Open House. It is the oldest garden show in America, and when I lived in London, I used to love to go to the Chelsea Flower Show. I mean, I love gardens, and um, so it's a, it's a really big deal, and I just, you know, and gardens have sort of been part of the story, and it's part of farming in Virginia and everything, and so, um, there was a book written um, by a woman who was affiliated with the White House Historical Society and she, Association, and it was on the gardens of Bunny Mellon. And Bunny Mellon um, designed the White House Rose Garden, and she, I mean, the Mellons gave, it's that Mellon family, um, gave heaps of money, I think, to the National Gallery and everything else, but they had an estate also in Middleburg that was to die for, and Bunny Mellon's gardens were extraordinary. So basically I kind of, and I had my character apprentice with Bunny Mellon who just 
you made these beautiful gardens. And it's just such a big part of, of Virginia life. It's part of, you know, the South and, and sort of Southern hospitality and, 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 and the, in Virginia, your gardens are sort of an extension of your, of your home. And it's, 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 a, it's a really big deal here. Our gardens are, are really big. Well, I've been, yeah, I've been to the Virginia Garden Show, and, you know, one of the joys of Monticello, which we've already talked about, is the University of Virginia um, and Charlottesville, which, which Jefferson designed, one of the joys of it is, in fact, the gardens. Oh, um, especially yeah. now, it's cherry blossom season here, Barbara, it is gorgeous, it's just perfect right now. I'm sure it is. Um, we actually have a, a particularly beautiful spring season in the desert, which is quite different. Instead of cherry blossoms, we have Palo Verde trees, which are these big, beautiful posts of yellow. Well, you've seen, no, you haven't, because you're here in November when none of this yeah. stuff is I mean, happening. Yeah. And, you know, the, the cacti bloom, there's gorgeous stuff, the succulents bloom, um, the oleander is out, there's all kinds of things. We just had our whole garden landscaped and it's, it's really beautiful, but it's so different. From, yeah, you well, know, you don't, you don't have to worry about deer and you know eating your garden. No, That's no, we don't. We have coyote, um, but they yeah. they tend to want to eat protein rather than. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. in any case, um, I think we're all more conscious right now of of nature and gardening because you know we've we've been either stuck indoors or we're sitting in our homes looking out and wondering why they don't look better or whatever whatever we're yeah. doing. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so Parker Lord, who. Um, I really like, and I, I have to tell you, I mean, he, he dies quite soon. I was really, really hoping he was not going to be oh. the instigating incident in this. I wanted him to carry on, but it was pretty clear to me that Parker was not going to survive this book very long, yeah. um, and he doesn't. And so he is the, the mystery, he is this the murder right. coming very early in the book that... Um, where all these different threads are are going to get pulled um, right. towards solving Parker's murder. I mean, there has to be some, we just had a discussion, if you were listening, I think you were, with Kara Black and Reese Bowen about the difference between thrillers and, and you know, more classic crime. And one of the biggest differences that in a thriller, it's about who's going to win. You know who the good guy and the bad guys are as a general rule. And, and so it's a, it's a contest to see who's going to get away with what and so forth. But in a mystery, there's, you have to work your way towards the things that you don't know. Right. You know? And that gets harder and harder in this series as I go along. Well, it does, you know, and in a small place too, you, yep. you are, um, you know, you always run up against the Jessica Fletcher thing. But in any case, when Parker Lord dies, then we, the question is not just who killed him, but the why of it. And to get to the why of it and eventually zero in on the killer, if one can, you wind up with all these different investigative threads. And that is what this book does in such an interesting way is that it pulls in Jackie and it pulls in gardens and it pulls in the National Women, what is it, the National Museum for yeah. Women in the Arts yeah. and it pulls in Bunny Mellon and yeah. it pulls in Madame Vigée Lebrun and her portrait yeah. of Marie Antoinette. And you think there is no way that this is going to work, but in point of fact, it actually does. So, if you, if are you a fan of Madame Vigée Lebrun? I've always thought if I were going to write a biography, she's the person I would write it. I didn't know anything about her until um, until I have to tell you my my my, my nimbus story until my friend introduced her and she was one of the people who Rosemary suggested to me. So, one of the very last things that we did before we knew. Um, you know, the pandemic started, was we, she said, let's go into Washington and, 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 and I'll introduce you to the director and the assistant director. I was like, let's do it. So, so we went into Washington. It's this beautiful building, as you know, it's not on Museum Row. It's not on the wall or anything. It was used to be um, um, a Masonic, a, a building, a Masonic building. Um, and it's, it's more like a hotel or something. I mean, it's just, it's not your classic museum. So we went there and I met, um, I met the director and I met the deputy director and the deputy director and my friend and I sat down for coffee and we were talking and I said, you know, I want these paintings to go to this museum. So how would I do that? And she said, and who would be the person who we'd talk to and how would that work? And she said, well, you know, you'd really want her to be the curator. And I said, okay, fine. And she said, you know, our curator is this amazing person. And she said, you've got to talk to her. You've got to meet her. Come back another time and, you'll, and you, you can, you can hear it, Katie. And she said, you can spend some time with her. So 
this is, you know, the end of February, early March, we go home and there's no going back. So the museum closes. So I'm thinking, well, you know, it's closed. I mean, what are they doing? They probably have their feet up, you know, they can't do anything. So I wrote the deputy director back and I said, um, you know, could I at least talk to her over the phone? And she wrote me back and said, no, there is no way. She said, we are crazy busy. And I said, like, what are you doing? And she said, do you know how hard it is to stop all the exhibitions that are coming here. She said, we don't know where the paintings are. We don't, you know, we've got stuff that we've, you know, we don't know where anything is in the process. Everything just stopped suddenly. And we're trying to find paintings that we borrowed from people and, you know, and, and where certain acquisitions are. And are they in some storehouse somewhere? Are they on a freight or, a you know, some ship? And where are they? She said, we are just crazy busy. And that was the end of that. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do? But as it turned out, um, I, I, um, allowed a character to be auctioned off for one more page in Arlington, Virginia. They did a fundraiser at the bookstore here. And the woman who won, it was for her best, or one of her dearest friends who was um, dying of cancer. And the woman, this Mar her name is Marilyn um, Gilbert Bernard, and she became the curator in the book. And so Marilyn actually passed away before she found out that she won. And her friend was determined she was gonna win. So my character went for the second most money for the one more page auction, except for um, the public relations, lunch with the public relations people for the Washington Capitals after the, after the Caps had won the Stanley Cup. So I was really pleased about that. So anyway, so, uh, so I called, so, I, so while I couldn't meet um, Katie, I thought, well, at least I can find out about Marilyn. So I, I spoke to her friend and I said, what is she like? And she turned out she was um, a, a school librarian in the Fairfax County, Virginia Public Library uh, system. And she was much beloved. And to this day, there were so many of her, st of her students who credit their love of reading um, for, with, because of Marilyn. And um, in the book, if you've read it, um, Marilyn uh, at the museum owns a Venus flytrap and has it on her desk. And whenever something's going wrong, she always will say, well, my plant hasn't eaten in two weeks, you know. And apparently the real Marilyn had a Venus flytrap and she said the same thing to the students who came in. So that was how I sort of fixed the fact that I never got back to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. So oh, nice. well done. I like that. But why did you decide to use a Vijay Lebrun portrait on Marie Antoinette? Um, I, you know, again, I was doing more research. And so um, I started reading about, there was a book called Jackie is Editor. And I started reading about what book she'd edited. And when I found out she edited a book on, on Marie Antoinette, I was like, it was just sort of a no brainer to sort of put that together. And I thought, and so what I did is I had her writing a book about Vijay Lebrun and Marie Antoinette, and then I, um, that she never finished, which is when this diary um, ends up in this box of things that, um, some, you know, her friend inherits, um, along with the paintings. And so that's, that's how I pieced it together. It was just, it was, she'd actually written, you know, she edited the letters of Marie Antoinette and, and her mother. So it was pretty easy to do. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. I like it. So anyway, um, that's the basic setup for the book. Um, how much wine is there in this book? Mm, not a whole lot. I mean, you know, it kind of got to be a thing that every book was a wine and a, you know, and, and, and after a while, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, we've, we've known each other forever. And before I started, even started writing these books and I only thought I was going to write one. And then I kept getting asked for more and more and more. And, and finally I thought, I, you know, I can't just keep doing the, 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 the alliterative wine title and the, and the mm -hmm. wine. And I thought I'm going to have to go in another direction. What am I going to do? And so as I was thinking about the bigger art for the book, I thought, well, it's going to have to be more about the vineyard than a wine itself, which is why, and the next book is quite a lot about climate change. Um, the one I'm writing now that's due in May um, to my, to my editor. And it's, if I'm going to be true to the series, um, I've got to start thinking about, you know, more that sort of going down that road. And so it's more about where does our food come? What, you know, what, what are we eating and drinking and, and what's happening to our climate? And, and so there's less of the wine, although in the book I'm writing on, there's actually a lot about, you know, about the whole part about growing the grapes and, you know, growing and, and working in the vineyard as opposed to just like drinking the wine. Um, so it just, it just seemed kind of like the way it would evolve to me. Well, I think it's quite natural because by good fortune, Lucy's wine estate is one of the most historic parts of the United States. It's near Washington, D.C. It has access to all kinds of interesting people, some really serious money, yes. um, as, as we see in this particular book. Um, you know, there's a storied past. Um, and so even though it's relatively small, as you say, like Middleburg, you know, it had people like 
Bunny Mellon and Jacqueline Kennedy and so forth there. So I don't think it's at all um, a stretch that, you know, you would be widening your circle to be writing about um, all of the things that are possible there. If you had set this in, you know, rural Arkansas or something, I think, you know, you obviously couldn't do that, but. Did we have the conversation? I think we might've done. Do you remember Earl Hammer wrote this, he wrote a, he wrote a series and it turned out to be, what was the name? It was, it was, it was a television series about a vineyard in California. What was it called? It was in the 80s. Oh. We both know what it is and it'll come to both of us. Um, yeah, but that series. So that was actually, he was from Virginia and that oh. was supposed to be set in Virginia. And when they sold it, that's it. Someone, someone's going to put it in the chat. Please put it in the chat. Um, so when when he sold it to California, they said, there's just no way anybody's going to buy anything about a vineyard in Virginia. You need to move that series to California. And that was supposed to, I mean, Virginia would have been so much more famous if it had been, um, not not slanting, that was the other one. Oh, um, I, I can recommend, there's a really long-term um, French mystery series called The Blood of the Vine which yeah. is about a, a French uh, and unophile wine critic, Pierre Arditi, who has aged over the series. And at this point, he, he only can kind of move very slowly. So there's not a lot of action in it anymore. <laughs> um, but it's and a Martin wonderful- Walker. Martin I, Walker. Really, I really love watching it. I mean, it's you know gone on for, it's on MHC TV. Okay. which I think you can now get on your um, Amazon Fire Stick, but oh. there's a ton of great French television and German, all kinds of other things on MHC. I watch it a lot. Yeah, um, I can't loves that because she bought it. She bought it. Line, um, is that it does what you're talking about. I mean, you know, wine is always, there's always wine, but um, he moves or a lot of it, of course, is in the Bordeaux, saint Emilion, you know, that region, because that's where he lives. But it does move around France. It goes from Chateau, it goes to cities. There are all kinds of aspects about the wine industry, which necessarily brings in restaurants and brings in money. And you can have terrible family disputes. The French inheritance system is just like off the nightmare. Off. And so it's a constant battle if you're trying to keep together and a state of um, what what happens um, yeah. and you know much of traditional France is kind of is breaking up but um, yeah. for those who who work in the wine industry in particular I think it's hard for them to have like Louis Vuitton come in and you know or or the Chinese well, whatever. The, yeah the Chinese are buying them now it's yeah the Chinese and so forth so they're having sort of the same problems that the rest of the world has and that appropriation, you know, money comes in and, you know, it's like the Saudi buying up London or the Japanese buying up Hawaii or, you know, the Americans buying up whatever. But, um, but I think that his series is a really good blueprint for what you want to do because it varies from wine center to family drama, to embezzlement, to, you know, huge mix. Do you know, I moved, I had one book that was set partly in California and I had another book that was set partly yeah. in DC. And I heard back from a lot of people who said, well, you didn't have it at the vineyard. And I got more pushback than I thought I might've done about that, which was really interesting because they wanted it there. And I thought, you know, I- Yeah, I, but that's, that's readers, you know, trying to-, yeah, to yeah. If, if you stay in Virginia, there's a lot of Virginia. Yes. There's yeah. a lot of I'm Eastern Virginia, of Wentz, you know. You know? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, you know, I lived in Western Virginia for a long time and there wasn't like a lot of wine being grown up there in the Appalachian foothills, but you certainly have a, a big territory and Washington is, you know, right there. So you get Washington, Alexandria and so forth. Um, and even on a stretch, Maryland, I mean, you know, you're Annapolis, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a big, I think of it sort of like title Virginia. Yeah, you know, yeah, there's. I mean, even you Very know, you can even veer down south towards you know Norfolk and Williamsburg, and you know, all. You've got a big territory you could work in. Yeah. Without yeah. without necessarily then leaving the vineyard completely. And there's so much. Fine. That that was the big thing that you know that was what as I started to write more and more books, I thought I, there's only so far personally as a writer that I can go with the wine. I mean, it's 
it's interesting, yeah. but it's not going to, you know, as, as someone who's going to spend a year sort of intellectually, you know, kind of like doing the research and writing the book, I have to find something that engages me and then that will be interesting to my readers too. And so more and more, it was like, oh, I'm a history nut anyway. Um, and there's all this history. And as somebody who was born in Boston and grew up in New England and Connecticut, um, I didn't know anything about the history down here. I didn't, you know, I sort of didn't, I mean, Northern Virginia is pretty close to Washington, but Virginia, Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. And the book I'm writing about now is, um, I finally, I'm gonna touch the third rail. I'm writing about the Confederate monuments. And it's been a very tough book to write because okay. most of the monuments were in, in our, were in Virginia. And so much of the Civil War was, they always say, Gettysburg had four bad days, Virginia had four bad years. So there's a lot here. And um, it's, I just think there are a lot of sort of um, veins to mine that could keep me sort of interested intellectually and so that I could write something that I think my readers would like. And I think you told me once you said that I have great fans. I really do, I have wonderful fans. I mean, they're, they're smart, they, they read carefully and, and they want a, you know, they want a good story. So I feel like that's what I really have to Well, do. I think that's all true and let's face it, you know, the Montgomery estate, it's not big enough, there's not enough money, you know, um, for it to be the constant center of all of this. You know, it's not like a Rothschild, you know, Grand Cru estate or somewhere yeah. near, you know, somewhere in, in Burgundy. Right. Um, or Bordeaux. So um, yeah, I think it's a natural extension. We haven't even mentioned the fact that you used to be a very good journalist. So, you know, it, I think it, um, in fact, the first book of yours I ever read was set in Moscow. Um, didn't have anything to do with, um, with the wine industry. You wrote, I'm trying to remember, was it two before you began to write the wine books? I wrote Moscow two? Nights, which was a standalone and it was published, right. it's now published over here. But, um, and then my British literary agent wanted to know what I wanted to do next. And we had come, we were living in London and we had come home for the summer and we had a friend who was really, he was Mr. Virginia. And he thought that, you know, Andre was French and he thought we should see the Virginia vineyards. And Andre was, was like, why? You know, I mean, we, we've seen the French vineyards. I mean, why would you want to do this? And um, so we went and I, I, we came back and I just fell in love with the setting because Virginia is beautiful. I mean, it's a really, really beautiful place. Yeah. And so I got, when I got back, I was talking to my agent about it. And she said, you know, that'd be a great setting for a book. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, um, well, you know, the next book I want to write, I, I want a foreign setting. And she said to me, and I've told the story a million times, she said, Ellen, you live in, in England, Virginia is a foreign setting. And I thought, yeah, it's kind of hard to argue with that. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll write one. <laughs> and then I came back to America and Dominic, my agent, um, picked me up and he said to me, well, of course it has to be a series. And I was like, of course it does. <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna say at that point? So I wrote two and then they wanted two more and then they wanted two more. And then at the end of six, I thought, I have written to the edge of the page here. So I wrote two books about a journalist, again, a right. photojournalist. And, and then um, the series moved to Minotaur and they were like, we like the wine books. So I wrote four for them and now it's moved again and they wanted two more. So, you know, one does what one does. Well, I, it is what one does, but I, you know, you, the two that you wrote in the middle of all this that you just pointed out, there's a ton of history in them. I, I mean, you know, in the sense that, I mean, I don't remember the name of one of them, but, but certainly- Closure and Ghost Image. Okay. Um, but. But in point of fact, you could really have pulled out all of that history and dropped it into a, a wine country mystery if you, you know. I probably you, could because there was a garden and there was all about yeah. gardening. It was all about gardening. Yeah. 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 So. No, I think, I, I mean, I think that's your natural bent, so to speak. But in any case, being a journalist by training allows you, I think, to pursue complicated plots like this with, with history and so forth in a way that, um, maybe it would be more difficult for, for other writers, but I've always enjoyed yeah. following you wherever you want to go. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's really been a pleasure. So we do have a few autographed copies of the French Paradox left, but uh, so Ellen's, Ellen's new publisher is uh, located in England. And for those of you who have been a little bit puzzled about the supply side, the difficulty is that they they're printed and then they have to float by boat um, to get here. And so it does lead to, well, we've all just lived through the Suez Canal thing. So you can wow. see that um, it only takes one ship to not float and then things go they're, they're on the third printing. They've had to do two more printings. Wonderful. Um, but anyway, you just need to be patient if you are 
purchasing a book by this publisher um, in the United States because their primary publishing is in is in England. So right. I've had this conversation with many American authors who have signed up for them and then are surprised by how it goes. So I warned Ellen. Yes, and, you, um, did. you did, you did. Oh. Um, anyway, we're fine. So let me call Patrick back up and see what he might have to say. Well, it's, it's funny. A few people have identified the, uh, the television show that you were thinking oh, of. Oh, what was it? Falcon Crest. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. 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 Isn't that great? Everybody has a phone, but us, cause we look stupid if we're on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> yes. Thank um, you all. <laughs> Let's see, uh, someone named Gasper asks. Oh, he wrote me today. Yeah, it's a great name, Gasper Genovese. Yep. Great name. Uh, in Vineyard Victims, Lucy was thinking of going to a doctor for her leg, but nothing was mentioned in the next two books. Does she in this book or will she in the future? Um, you know, she's, she is disabled and I, you know, kind of gone back and forth about what I might do about this. My, my husband had a similar disability and he actually, I think I brought all that up around the time that he had um, some pretty um, amazing surgery to rebuild his foot. And it was like the bionic man. So I think that's kind of where that came from. But if you'll notice, if you read carefully, um, her brother has a fiance who later becomes his wife, who's a physical therapist who deals with this sort of thing. So I've kind of just left some unwoven threads there. So that's, so. So that's, the answer is maybe. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Um, Jim Collins, who you may know. Oh, another, he's another friend of mine. Okay, we went to school together. He says, hi, hi, Ellen. I hope everyone at your house is well. Uh, as always, I'm so impressed by the amount of research you do. Do you spend more time on the research than on the actual writing, or how do you how do you balance the two? Um, I could probably spend almost all my time on the research because I love it. But what I do, I used to in the old days was I always started at the library, and I, this book I haven't been able to. But but I I start reading, and then I start kind of you know blocking things out and putting that laying the plot out, and then I go back and do more and more research, and then I sort of find. The people I want to talk to, the experts, and I try to save them for the end so that by the time I'm talking to these particular people, I'm asking for sort of the smart questions, you know, like the, that I've done my homework and that they're impressed enough that they'll, they'll talk to me and tell me things. And I have so, I, Barbara, you probably heard this from so many authors, I have so missed being able to go out and talk to people. This has been really hard. Cara, I don't know if Cara told you, we were talking the other day when I interviewed her at the Virginia Book Festival, she hasn't gone to Paris and Dems Karami hasn't gone to England and they are really suffering. So not being able to get out has been tough. So I do a lot of research, you know, there's the internet, there's the phone, I, you know, I read, um, but I really, really like getting out and talking to people and I find I get a lot of energy from that. So I, you know, like I, I went to Jamestown, I went to the Folger Library for, you know, a couple of books ago. I mean, I, I like to go to all the places where I write about and get that kind of, you know, energy off them and get, you know, get sort of the, all the, all the sensory information that you can, you know, that you get from it. Um, so, but at some point you have to sit down and write. And I take a ton of pictures. I take so many pictures. Well, you mentioned Deborah Crombie and guess who's watching? Hello. Hello, Deborah. <laughs> hey, Deb. Uh, no question. She just says hi. Uh, hi, back. Let's see. A lot of people are just saying they love all of your wine mysteries. Um, Deb says, I love the Sophie Medina books. Oh, thank yeah. you. Me too. Um, Me too. Thank you. Well, Deb, if you're watching, you can tell Patrick. Do you agree with me that much of the material in the Sophie Medina books, in fact, could have been in a um, Lucy Montgomery book, if if Ellen he had done a little work with it, because I certainly hardly felt any difference. We'll wait for her to reply. Put her on. Yeah, the we'll spot. see if she That's replies. Uh, <laughs> Serena, uh, Serena, who watches a lot of our programs, um, she says uh, or she asks, "Do you find it hard switching publishers during a long-standing series?" I imagine it probably is. Um, it's. It's different. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I've been really lucky. I've been with some, you know, really wonderful publishers. And it's more specific as the editor, you know, and um, and I've had some I've had some really good editors. I had at one point there was a time when there was a lot of turnover and that was that was tough. 
Um, and I, in fact, didn't really have an editor and somebody from the outside was editing my books and this was, you know, it, it, and that, that was difficult. But um, when you get an editor, you can really connect with it's really good. And, and I, my new editor now, Kate, I love her. I, I knew I met her. She's, you know, she lives in London. Um, but I, when I met her in Dallas at BoucherCon, you know, I, we lived in London for five years. I, I love London. Um, and I, there was, I met her and I thought she's going to let me do what I want. She's going to just going to be, it's going to be my book. And she's not going to, she's not going to be, I would say, heavy handed. And sure enough, when I got my editorial letter back, she wrote back, it was three pages, and she said, I loved it. I mean, if I could ever bronze a letter, I would have bronzed this one because it was, it was, it was, you know, she clearly very carefully read the book, but she said, and she told me what she loved about it, what I did well, and why she just liked it so much. And she said, I have no revisions for you. And so um, who was asking me? Oh, I was um, interviewing, Colleen Shogun was interviewing me for um, uh, at one more page. And, and and I said, you know, this book is really all me um, because because uh, my editor let me, you know, write my own, you know, sort of write my book. And I think for any, you clearly want an editor to help you and, you know, save you from yourself and, and make the book better. But when you get that kind of um, support, I think it's just very affirming and really, um, it's, it's, it's just great. And it, it just, it's very energizing. So I, I really, I really enjoyed that. Uh, you have... Deborah has spoken. <laughs> he says, uh, yes, I agree, Barbara. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, especially in this new book. Yeah, exactly. This one, I think, is the closest to the Sophie Medina book that I was, I was talking about. Um, All the, French stuff, yeah. the, the, the history and so forth is the, the local is phenomenal. Um, in answer to the person who asked about how hard it is to change publishers, the, the casualty when you change publishers is very often the backlist. That is to say, the older books that are owned by one publisher um, sometimes stay in print and sometimes it becomes difficult to find them. So that for a reader is, is more of a problem than it is for the author. I mean, Ellen is carrying on writing. I've been really lucky though, because Scribner, where I did the first six books and the two Sophie books, um, they were wonderful. And in fact, my editor, my last editor at Scribner worked with my new editor at Minotaur and said, um, when Ellen's last book comes out from Scribner, we'll put the first chapter of the Minotaur book and you know, they do the teaser chapters and that's kind of like Coke and Pepsi saying, we'll collaborate. And it was wonderful. And then she said, we'll do the same thing for the ebook and everything ah. else. And Scribner actually bought the rights back for all of my six books from Pocket Books, which is now Gallery. And they've got them all in print. So yeah, I've been- I said, it is, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't a constant, but it can be true that sometimes yeah. um, the older books disappear, which is, again, is a problem for the reader, but yeah. you're yeah. keeping moving forward. So it's a different yeah. question for you. Yeah. And there's something there's there's um you know I mean I get royalties from you know from Minotaur and from and from Simon Schuster. Um, there's something to be said for keeping the series going. Um, you know I don't know if I told you the Dix Francis story when Felix Francis came to Middleburg uh, a number of years ago and he was talking about the fact that he was sure that his father's books were going to generate royalties in perpetuity not only for his mother but for him and his wife. And a couple of years down the road, um, Dick's agent called Felix into London and said, "Hey." you know, the money's drying up. And he said, your father's not writing anymore. And even though he'd written so many and, you know, they were, I mean, they're just, Dick Francis books are just like legendary. Um, he said, you know, the, these young buyers at Waterstones and W.H. Smith, they're just not ordering them. I mean, there's, and so they're not gonna keep the old ones on the shelf. So he said, why don't we do what so many authors of, you know, estates are doing, which is find somebody to keep the franchise going. And Felix said, well, before you do that, let me have a stab at it. And so if you don't write the books, don't you think, Barbara, I mean, they sort of don't, you know, they kind of fade. Don't, I mean, the series fades. Well, right? it's a question, it's a question of demand. It takes more, more often, it takes a new book to interest, you know, to drive sales for the backlist. I'm, I'm just finishing writing our April newsletter and there are any number of reviews where I will say, let's take Anna Lee Huber, for example. This is the ninth Lady Derby mystery. They're a lovely set of um, historicals set in Scotland, I think it is, Edinburgh, um, 19th century that come from Berkeley. And it would make much more sense to read them from the beginning, not start with number nine. But that only works if the first eight are available. Right. So yeah. I always look and see. And when they are, you know, I will I will put a link to the whole series and say, you know, if you this 
sometimes it doesn't matter, but but very often in a series, especially if it's got some romance in it and family stuff and all, it does matter if you read it from the beginning because there's just a whole set of spoilers that are going to come your way. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's because that new book prompts me to do that. But in the absence of a new book, I would have absolutely no reason to say to people, try the first eight. Right, you know, right, Lady Darby right, mysteries right. because I mean, why? You know, I, I I'm sure right. I can keep up with the new stuff, and I I think that um, it does take that engine of a new publication so that when somebody uh, no longer is writing, whether retirement or death or whatever, yeah. um, there's a tendency for the whole thing to fade away, and thus something generates more interest again, or sometimes. It can take like a whole new generation of readers. For example, Rebecca's having a moment because yes. the Gothic, as I have said for the last two years, tiresomely, the Gothic is having a big revival in the seminal Gothic book that people tend to think of unless you want to go back to the castle of Otranto or whatever. Um, modern Gothic is Rebecca. So all of a sudden, there's probably more people buying Rebecca right now than did for, for ages. You know, because there's a new interest in that kind of book, even though Demaria can't write any more books. She's been dead a long time. But am I seeing a lot of sales for Jamaica Inn or, you know, some of the other books she wrote? No, it's really just Rebecca because, oh, really? it, yeah. So, you know. Well, I think the other thing as an author is um, if you write one book that kind of feeds into the next and the next, you that's that can be problematic. If you can, and I always like it when somebody will review it and they'll say, "Well, you know, you should read the rest of the series, but it can be read as a standalone because it it's just the kiss of death." If it's like, "Well, you won't, you will have no clue, you know, what's going on if you read this book unto itself." And so, the trick for an author, I think, writing a series becomes how do you keep those who've been with you, you know, like not go over the same thing over and over again or find a new way to say something, um, but set the stage for the people who are reading for the first time. And that's that's really a tricky thing too, I think. Well, you know, the mystery has to be complete, but as we just mentioned, Lucy's getting married in this book, okay? So if you have a, if you go back and you want to read one of the earlier books and Lucy meets Gwen and you think, hmm, I wonder if anything's ever going to come right, of that. Right, right, right. You, you know the answer to that before you ever get there. And it isn't the mystery that, that is going to be solved. I mean, it's going to be spoiled. It's going to be the relationships that um, have have evolved. Yeah. You know, people have babies. I mean, yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, we didn't know at the beginning that, you yeah. know, how it was all going to work out for, for Gemma and, you know, and Kincaid. And, exactly. you know, we didn't know if they'd have a family, all those things. And so if you happen to read one of the new ones, and then you go back all the way, you know, to... What's my favorite of your titles? Leave the grass green, which I've always gotten wrong. Um, you know, it, it's a different experience reading it. It isn't that the mystery is going to be a problem. It's going to be the personal stuff that's going to be the problem. But anyway, I waxed on. Any other questions, Patrick? I did. It's probably because I'm getting hungry and I don't have any wine. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, they're kind of a silent group. I don't. Okay. I think we've well, kind of covered just about everything. It was wonderful to hear from all of you. Thank you so much. And Ellen, it's always a pleasure. Oh, I wish this were in person, but I'm so glad we could do it this I way. Know. Are you going to come to Washington when this is all over and have your event? That you're going to come to the Library of Congress and the National? Oh, um, yep, I need to visit the family books. There's a new Rosenwald librarian whom I have not met, but we've corresponded. And I'm hoping Catherine Neville will still want to have a party for the Library of Congress Crime of Classics. Of course. Which would be fabulous. So yeah, yeah. many okay. things, many things to do in Washington. There's a gorgeous new book out from the Smithsonian about his gem collection that just absolutely knocked me on my socks and reminded yeah. me that if I go to Washington, I'm definitely going to go visit the fabulous okay. gems at the Smithsonian. So we'll yeah. see. Okay. In any case, um, good night, everybody. Thank you good for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank All you, right. Ellen. Thank you, Patrick. Good, good night. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.